OK, we are now recording. Um, I'm going to stop presenting my screen and um, you are now in control. Cool. Will it pop my screen up? Yes. You are up. I am. Well, your face is. <laughs> All right, perfect. OK, so for those of you who don't know me, my name is Paul Randazzo. I'm the event supervisor for the Rockhound event. I actually competed in this event back in the 1990s, and I've been supervising since I graduated high school, actually. Um, I also am the supervisor for the national event and for the high school locally, too, high school and middle school. Um, so I'm going to go through a quick PowerPoint. If anybody has seen this extravaganza presentation, it is essentially the same. And the PowerPoint that I'm going through is identical to the 2021 that's currently posted on the web page, short of, um, short of changing the dates on it. So I'm going to share my presentation here in just a sec. And... All right, can everybody see that? Or anybody see it? Oh, it's not at the top here. All right, so for the 2021 Science Olympiad, we all know um, what we're doing. Basically, I'm going to go through, talk about the event, um, some of the topics and an outline, go through a couple of tips you can do while you're coaching, um, how to make practice tests, how to put together a good team, some strategies the kids can use, and a couple of resources. So this is right from the rules. It says a team of up to two students will demonstrate knowledge of rocks, minerals, and geology principles. Um, all they can bring in is their pencils and a chart, which I'll talk about more in a minute. And the format will be about 20 stations. I think it will be 20 stations and about 100 questions, which it'll probably be exactly 100. Um, the topics in the event itself are identification of samples. That's actually probably half of the event. Um, and then the other half would be the things that we do with the rocks and their properties and things that they have. Um, and this year is a metamorphic rock emphasis, which I will elaborate on that in a minute too. Um, so to start out with, minerals are the building blocks of rocks. They're pure natural, crystalline solids. So um, it's the same material all the way throughout and they have different properties. So streak is um, the color when you rub the mineral on an unglazed porcelain tile. What color it leaves, that's called the streak. The hardness, we look at the Mohs scale of hardness, which is a relative hardness scale between all the different minerals. Specific gravity or density, like how, how heavy is it compared to water. The luster, how does light reflect off of it? Um, the crystal habit or the crystal form. So what shapes does it grow into naturally? And the color, and there's even more things, but that's a, a good start. Um, as for the rocks, there's three different types of rocks, igneous, sedimentary, and metamorphic. So igneous ones are like, think lava, melted rock. Sedimentary rocks are ones that were broken, moved, and then stuck back together, basically. And metamorphic rocks are any other type of rock that got heated and changed somehow, squeezed under pressure and or heat. Um, and all rocks are made of minerals, so there's at least two or more minerals in each rock. Um, depending on which minerals are in there and how their crystal shapes are and how they're related um, tells us what type of rock it is. And sometimes it gives us insight into how that rock formed too, which is pretty cool. So for your practicing with your kids, um, you can give them quizzes, you can give them samples. Honestly, if you have access to samples or you can find or get some samples to access, that's probably the most helpful thing you can do. Um, all sorts of different activities you can do to have the kids arrange them in different groups of similar hardness or similar luster or similar crystal form or whatever, um, and have them build this chart, which I'll talk about some more in a little bit too. Um, 
As far as the actual event, there's going to be 20 stations. They'll be actually in like little Rubbermaid boxes. And on the lid of the box, there's going to be letters. And the kids will go to up through the alphabet. I'll tell them when to open the box. They'll get some time in it. Usually it's about a minute. Um, they read the questions and then I'll tell and answer them on their clipboard, on their answer sheet. And then I'll tell them when to close the box and then move to the next station. Um, so they'll go all the way through the alphabet. The questions are underneath the lid. And then samples are almost always in the box. Sometimes if they're really big, I'll put them next to the box. But um, I'm going to use zip grade answer sheets. So it's like a Scantron style bubble, fill in the bubble answer sheets. And um, the questions will have different point values. I'm not going to list which ones are of which point values. And I actually do all the way down to decimal points. So some are 1.4 and some are 2.6. And I grade them based on how difficult I feel like the question is. And also having such different decimal points helps me avoid ties. So it works out really well. Um, usually when we have a bigger crowd than we're going to this year, um, if we just had 100 points possible, there would be tons of ties. Um, but there ends up being, you know, 300 points down to decimals. So um, there's usually either no ties or very, very few ties. Um, so this year, um, there's an emphasis on metamorphic rocks, and that means that we added just a couple of things. Um, we added two rocks and three minerals. So I don't want you guys to just study metamorphic rocks or just study metamorphic rock processes. Um, the emphasis is commensurate to the expansion on the list, those two extra rocks and three extra minerals. So make sure that you're evenly studying everything on the list. Um, so that's that's important. The, the new rocks that I added this year are phyllite and mica schist. And then the minerals are garnet, kyanite, and storolite, which are minerals that are markers for metamorphic rocks. They tell you what rocks they, the parent rock might have been for the metamorphic rock and how much heat and pressure um, it was placed on. The presence of those crystals are important for that. So they're, they're cool metamorphic related minerals. Um, so I will only ask the kids to identify samples on the list. I often will use one or two samples that's not on the list, um, just to kind of keep them on their toes and expose them to something new that they may have never seen. Um, but when I do that, I won't ask them to identify it, but I might ask them to identify a property, like what's the cleavage or the fracture of this mineral, or does it look like this rock may have cooled quickly or slow or or slowly? Um, something that they should be able to answer based on their skill set without even knowing what the particular sample is. Um, so this goes for every event. Make sure you check the Macomb SO website for any clarifications. My particular event's pretty easy, um, but still, whatever it says on the website is what the rules are. Um, at your practices, whether you meet once a week or however, however often you can, give the kids quizzes whatever you can. Come up with any kind of games you can think of, um, what, whatever you can think of to get them engaging and interacting, especially with samples, because this event truly is hinged on identification. A lot of times, identification are, like I said, maybe half of the questions. And if you don't get the identification right, then your follow-up questions are maybe going to be wrong, too. So it's important to, to have them actually look at samples because I'm going to use samples. Um, I try and avoid using pictures as much as possible. Um, one of the best things I think is for your practicing is to have them group things together. So, you know, what, what type of rock are these? What's the mineral family? What's the, which ones share the same fracture or, or whatever? Um, come up with things that they can relate and, and notice similarities and differences among different rocks or minerals. Um, as for the chart, the chart is something that the students need to make, and it can be up to a legal size piece of paper, so eight and a half by 14. It can be smaller if you want. You can use both sides, they can write things as small as they want. Um, 
but a lot of times I feel like the most effective charts are the ones that the kids can find things quickly on. So again, that comes back to them making it themselves. themselves. If they made it, they know where to find the information. When I'm only giving them around a minute to answer four or five or six questions, um, they don't have time to really like dig through a chart. But if they can't remember whether um, quartz is harder than gypsum and they want to look on their chart to reference that, as long as they know where that information is, it's going to help them. So um, I would say sort of keep it simple. You don't need to put too, too much information on there, but those things that are hard to memorize are good to put on the rock chart, rock and mineral chart. Um, so these are things that I do. These are things that you can do when you're um, making practice tests is make sure the kids know what their, you know, what the rules are. Um, make sure that what you're asking a question about, like if I'm asking about a, a cleavage or a fracture, I want to make sure that that sample actually shows that characteristic. So I would do that too. Um, sometimes I'll put just one sample, but usually I'll put more than one sample at a station. And then at my event, I label them with letters. Each sample has a letter glued onto it. And I make sure that the stickers with those letters are different colors than the boxes adjacent before and after in case a kid were to pick up a sample and accidentally bring it to the next station. Um, it would easily stick out because it's the wrong color sticker. Um, so those are things I do to, to help keep the kids on track. Um, sometimes I'll give them some a formula or some extra information. Sometimes I won't. Um, and same with, with a magnifier. Maybe I will ask them, you know, give them a magnifier if I'm asking about something that they really need it to see. Um, and I try and spread things out so the, the test is pretty representative of the, the rock and mineral list. Um, so everything's more or less covered. Um, I'll go through how the kids are going to move from station to station pretty easily in the room. So We'll make sure that they know what they're doing. And I won't indicate the tiebreaker. So I'm going to pick a series of questions that if there's a tie, whoever does the best on a certain number of questions will end up winning the tie. But I don't get many ties now that I use zip grade with decimals. So I don't foresee that being a problem. Um, if possible, it's really nice to have more than two kids practice. Um, that way, if there's a scheduling conflict or someone is sick, um, then you'll have someone else that's prepared to compete. And also, as your kids age out and get into middle school or junior high, you'll have more kids that have already have that knowledge base for your team for next year. Um, I often notice, too, that the best teams are one kid is really good at identifying things and another kid has got the more abstract side of it. Um, a lot of times, if they can kind of pair their strengths, that makes a really strong team if possible. Um, it's really important to have them practice together, especially under um, a timed constraint like the event is going to be. Every year I see kids that will argue on the first question of the four or five or six or more in a station. They'll argue back and forth and not get to any of the other questions, but they need to be able to w work well together. That's really important. Um, also give them an opportunity to answer questions at like a practice um, station using the chart. So they have the ability to read a question, look on their chart, find that answer, and then mark it down. Um, under, again, so under a time constraint like it will be at the event. Um, so make sure that they can can do those things and practice so it's not their first time doing it at the competition. Um, so make sure you read the rules. Again, that goes for every event. And make sure that they can get as deep of a knowledge base as they can. There's really no limit. I wouldn't say, well, once you know all these things, you're good. Just have them keep learning, like as deep as they can get. Um, it's it's really good. I tell the kids to talk quietly. They never do. It's like usually a dull roar in the room. Um, and really, who knows if the person that they're listening to at the station next to them knows what they're talking about. I suppose that they don't. Um, but I do remind them, keep the specimens there. Don't leave your chart behind. And if you run out of time, 
fill in something because it can't hurt them. There's no penalty for guessing. I also usually have the opportunity at the end to give them a minute or two to look over their answer sheet and make sure that they've filled things in. If they haven't, um, they can put something, just mark something, because they have some better chance than, than leaving it blank. So uh, most importantly, make sure that the kids can identify the samples. That's, that's the key. And make sure they can work together. Once you got that down, make sure you do a good chart and have fun. So that is it for this PowerPoint. And I can take some questions. Let's see. Am I back onto here? Almost. Do I need to click something else? Um, so you stopped sharing your screen. OK. I, we just can't see you right now. All right. How about now? Yes, now we can see cool. you. Perfect. OK, so um, the floor is open now for any questions from any guests. So you can either raise the ha your hand, use the hand feature at the top of the screen. Um, OK, so first question, uh, Pamela William, go ahead whenever you're ready. Hi, um, so we are new to Science Olympia. And this is our first time doing it. And my son just kind of picked based on what he thought sounded interesting. Cool. So I have quite a few questions. OK. Uh, first would be, we know nothing about rocks and minerals. Where are we supposed to be learning this information from? Are we getting any kind of packets? Or do we have to go out there and find this stuff ourselves? So that's so, my first question. <laughs> yeah, there's no formal packet. I usually do a workshop that's like a, a four-part workshop in person at the MISD. I'm not doing it this year, but a previous year, like maybe five or six years ago, um, we recorded all of them and put them on YouTube. So I would definitely start with that. That'll give kind of a good overview of all the, the samples and the kind of things that I'm looking for. So um, where did you find, what's the name of that um, YouTube? Um, I, think, I think if you just type in Science Olympiad Rockhound, you'll find it. Okay. Yes, um, actually, if you go to Macomb, um, the Macomb Science Olympiad website, everything is right there. Awesome. And I think some of my PowerPoints are up there too. Yes. Um, and there might be one or two samples because we, we switch, we add and remove a couple of rocks and minerals every year. So the, you know, the videos and or the PowerPoints might be off by a little bit. Go by the rules. The rules, the posted rules are what it's actually going to be, but it'll be 95% of what you need to get a start there. Um, and then the other half is to get samples, which we normally um, sell rock and mineral kits at the workshop. And I don't know, Science Olympiad usually buys them and then distributes them. So I don't know if that's something that's happening this year or not. Um, so is nice. that something we can buy off of Amazon now then, or? I don't. May I step in for a moment? Yes, please. OK, so yes, we have quick start kits available awesome. online. So also under the resources tab on the Science Olympiad website, you will see the option um, to purchase quick start kits. And that actually comes with a full rock kit and the extra metamorphic specimens that he was mentioning earlier. Yeah, so that that would be really helpful. Having you know samples in the kids' hands is is really the number one thing. Also, there's probably a closet at your kids' school that has rocks and minerals in it that some teacher might sometimes bring out and would usually lend to you, but maybe not. But it's worth asking at the school. Hey, does somebody have some rocks that we can use? Um, and a lot of times they may be mislabeled or whatever, but. It's a good activity is research them. Let's look at them and try and identify them or whatever we can do. So that's often a resource that's there, even though it is sort of hidden. You have to ask for it. OK, and then is will the videos or PowerPoints show us samples of either the type of questions or quizzes and, and this chart, what this chart should be looking like? Gotcha. So the the videos don't really go through the questions, but there are sample tests on the Macomb SO webpage, which are pretty representative of how it's going to be. 
And then the chart, everybody kind of does it differently, but usually it's some Excel-ish chart that will, you know, go through those different properties like the hardness and the streak and specific gravity. Those are kind of the, the basic things that you want to make sure are on there, which are all those topics that I'll talk about on the video. Um, so like each of those highlights definitely should be on the chart. And then even more, like you'll want to get a book or two, whether you buy one or, or get it from the library um, to use as a reference to. So anything interesting that you see about a particular rock or mineral, might be handy because that's the kind of thing that I'm going to draw off of as well. Okay. All right. Well, I think that's the questions. I just want to make sure that this is because it seems complicated to me. So I want to figure, out, I want to figure out how to make it fun for my son because if not, he's just going <laughs> to shut down. So I gotcha. And that's actually one of the things that makes this event easy and hard. Like you can start anywhere and start learning and it can be really fun, but it's also open-ended, which makes it really hard. Like, as deep as the kids can go, I might challenge them that hard, um, too. So the, the competition, a lot of times, the highest, the person that wins really knew their stuff. Um, but I try and make the event also with enough questions that somebody that just did a little bit of studying feels like they did pretty well, too. Um, oh. One final question. Yeah. And then I'll open and let it up, let others ask. Is everybody in this um, category all new to this or have they done this before? This uh, this slow uh, rock hound. Have they done it? So are we going against people who've already competed in this category or is everybody new to it? Yeah. So Rock Hound has been an event since Science Olympiad started. So other kids that have competed in Science Olympiad in previous years may have competed in Rock Hound. Um, the metamorphic emphasis that I do, we do a, a three-year rotation. We'll do a metamorphic and an igneous and a sedimentary emphasis. So there's some new twist to it each year for the kids. Um, so mostly there, there may be some other kids that have competed before against them, but not with the metamorphic emphasis. Thank you. Yep, you're welcome. Thank you. Are there any other questions out there? Please raise your hand virtually. <laughs> Okay, I am not seeing any more. Um, nope, I am not seeing any uh, people raising their hands. Uh, nothing in the chat. So last chance for any questions you might have regarding Rockhound. Okay, there is none. So I guess that would conclude our Rockhound session. All right. All right. Thank you, everyone. I appreciate well, it. Thank you, Mr. Randazzo. We appreciate you. All right. All right. Well, take care. You too. Good luck, everyone. Thank you.